Very important three, three things that you're going to see up here right here is the federal regulation for underground storage tanks is 40 CFR 280. And 40 CFR 280 has been around since December the 22nd, 1988. And there's not a whole lot of federal regulations that's, that are still on the book that haven't been changed in this long of uh, a period of time. However, there is some stuff on the, uh, that's out there right now that this regulation is going to change. And so once you're certified, you guys, even though you are certified on what we're going to do here today, you're going to have to stay up with the regulation changes when they do occur. Probably won't occur, happen for another year, but along those lines. But f uh, the federal regulation is 40 CFR 280. <clears throat> Our Arkansas regulation number 12 is what mirrors that federal, reg federal regulation. And it became effective in April of 1990. Now, what actually got us all here together today for this certification uh, class uh, for A, B, and C operators is the Energy Policy Act of 2005. And it basically mandated there had to be at least one Class A, Class B, Class C operator for every underground storage tank facility in the state of Arkansas. So at least one operator in each required class for each underground storage tank facility. So uh, why are we doing this training? Basically what this is all about is if you guys are doing your job as an owner operator and are going out and walking through your facilities like you should on a, on a daily or a weekly basis, if you should happen to have a leak or a spill at your facility, you're going to catch it and you're going to catch it fast. The sooner you can do that, the less it costs to remediate the soil or the groundwater that's underneath your tanks. So we want you to operate in compliance with the state and federal requirements and also to prevent product uh, releases that could damage human health or the environment or result in costly cleanups. So here's basically a little summation of the three operator classes. You know, you're not really going to be tested on any of this stuff, but the Class, a operator is, the, the Class A operator is generally the owner of the facility. And but what I mean by that is he's the guy that, <clears throat> in case you're going to do any capital improvements to your tanks, this is a guy that can generally write the check and say, this is what we, what we need to do at the facility. Uh, <clears throat> he generally focuses on the statutory and regulatory requirements. Now, the Class A operator, he has to have a, a broad knowledge of what goes on in the underground storage tank facility. Now, the Class B operator is a guy that doesn't have to have that breadth of knowledge, but he has to have a more in-depth uh, knowledge of what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, what, what's required as far as record keeping at your facility. And so the Class C operator then is the individual that is not going to be on site when you guys are probably not there. And they need to know who to contact for <clears throat> emergency type stuff, emergency responders, uh, police, fire department, in case something happens at the facility when you're not there. So that's basically a breakdown on the three operator classes. And here basically shows what we just talked about is that the class A operator you can see needs to have a more, <clears throat> a wider knowledge than what the Class B operator has. The Class B operator needs to know what goes on day to day at the facility. And then you can see up in the corner, the Class C operator is not required to know a whole lot. And once, once you guys get certified as Class A, Class B, the department is gonna send some documentation, written documentation to you what we would like for you to convey to your class C's so that you don't have to read our, our mind. And whether you use it or not, that, that's up to you. But at least you'll know what we're looking for as far as uh, what we'd like for the class C operators to know. So <clears throat> the five things here that I think that are most important out of all the slides that are out there, and the first one has to do with you people with automatic tank gauges 
is the, the most common problem with leak detection at your facilities is ignored alarms. A lot of people that have automatic tank gauges, the alarms will go off. It's not uh, something that they'd like for their, the, the people filling up with gas at their facility to hear while they're there. It's kind of an inconvenience. So they'll go and shut off the alarms at the automatic tank gauge and then say, well, we'll take care of this stuff later. If the alarms go off, you need to find out why they're going off and then fix it. So the second thing up there is that the allowable leak detection rate for your monthly leak detection at your facility is 0.2 gallons per hour. That is the leak rate that you have to meet on a monthly basis. The third thing is, if you're out walking around your facility, most product releases are found by either you seeing them or you smelling them prior to your leak detection picking up that an alarm is going off. So you're probably going to see it or smell it before any uh, release detection equipment is going to indicate that you've got a problem. So you need to keep that in, in, in mind while you're out walking around your facility. If you suspect a problem, you need to investigate it and fix it. And the, the fifth one, when it comes down to you Class B operators, poor record, poor record keeping habits is generally what starts that leads to fines or civil penalties at your facility. So, you know, the records that you need to keep, keep them in order. It's important. Certification deadline. This, you will see this later today. Um, August 8th of 2012 is when everybody in the state of Arkansas has to have this certification. But August 8th, 2012, if you're not certified by that date, then you're out of compliance. So, what is an underground storage tank system? It's a tank including the underground piping that has at least 10% of its volume underground and which is used to store a regulated substance, gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel. 10% of its volume underground. Now we're going to talk about new versus existing underground storage tank systems. A new UST system is any tank that was put into the ground after December the 22nd, 1988. Those tanks, whenever they were put into the ground, they had to be compliant with all release detection and release prevention requirements. And they also had to have corrosion protection if you had any bare metal that was coming into contact with the moisture in the soil. So all those things on new tanks had to be in place at, if the tank was installed after December the 22nd, 1988. Now, the existing tanks were any tanks that were in the ground before that date. And what uh, happened here is the feds gave all people that had existing tanks, they gave them 10 years to retrofit or upgrade those existing tanks to those new tank standards. So anybody that had a tank, <clears throat> you know, as far as what it costs to retrofit these tanks, it was expensive. So a lot of people here is when they decided if they could and they had room to do it, this is where they went to above ground tanks just to stay away from these regulations as far as retrofitting existing tanks. So <clears throat> 10 years for them to be upgraded to the new tank standards. So that was from 88 to 98. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> each one of these underground storage uh, tank system components this morning. We're going to talk about tanks and piping, spill prevention, overfill prote uh, prevention, corrosion protection, and then all the forms of leak detection that's actually out there. And <clears throat> Typical underground storage tank system that you can see here. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'll point, point this out right now. Coming out of the backside of each one of these four tanks that you see that are in the ground, they have vent piping. <clears throat> Those vent pipes have to be at least 12 feet above ground. 
at least 12 feet above ground. Important. You can see a couple of tanks here that are manifolded together. These tanks that are, ma are manifolded with this piece of pipe, generally they hold the same uh, product grade of gasoline. They dispense at the same time from both tanks. We'll get to the fill pipe here in a minute. So <clears throat> the state of Arkansas, we're not endorsing any of these specific brands, manufacturers of, of, of this particular equipment or pipe that we're going to look at, but it's a way for you. Most everybody that has underground storage tank systems were not there whenever the, uh, the tanks got put into the ground. So this is the four types of, uh, of common tanks and the, the common piping that you're going to see in underground storage tank systems. The first <clears throat> of the common underground storage tanks is a cathodically protected steel tank. The second one is the fiberglass clad steel tanks. The third one is jacketed steel tanks. And the fourth one is fiberglass reinforced plastic tanks or FRP tanks. So four major types of tanks. Cathodically protected steel tank. This STIP3 stands for that this tank is protected in three ways from corrosion. The first being that it has electrical isolation bushings that are in the manways that are in the top of the tank. And so what, what these actually have are, are some Viton rings or rubber type rings that are in each one of those manways at the top of the tank. And so electricity is not allowed to be conducted over those bushings. So it's a way of isolating on this particular tank. The second mode is it has a dielectric protective coating that's on the outside of the tank. And that dielectric protective coating, it does not conduct electricity. And for corrosion to take place, it has to take place in an electrochemical corrosion cell. And this is a way that prevents that cell from being powered by having this dielectric protective coating on the outside of this steel tank. <clears throat> The third way that this tank is uh, protected is it has cathodic protection. And that cathodic protection, you can see, is welded to this particular tank. And generally, this cathodic protection that you're seeing here is what, what is called a sacrificial anode. And that sacrificial anode is generally made of zinc or magnesium. And generally, these particular bars are put onto these tanks before they're dropped into the soil. So this is a factory type thing. The guy's going to come out, do the, the, the potential between the moisture that you have in the soil and this tank, and then he's going to determine the, the size of the sacrificial or how many of these sacrificial anodes that he's going to weld to the outside of this tank. And while we're here, when we're looking at these sacrificial anodes, they only protect what they are attached to. So in this, in this case, if you get asked a question that if you have a sacrificial anode that's actually welded to the tank, what is it protecting? It's protecting the tank and the tank only. It's not protecting pipe. So it's protecting what it's attached to. So that's the STIP3 tank. And we'll talk a little bit more about this tank when we get into corrosion protection. Now, the next tank that's out there is the clad steel tank. And the clad steel tank <clears throat> has a non-corrodible material that's actually mechanically bonded to the outside of that steel that's on that tank. And it can be fiberglass, it can be plastic, it can be glass. It's something that's a very, very, very hard substance that's on the outside. And so basically what we're doing here with the clad steel tank, we've got this non-corrodible material that's on the outside of the steel it's preventing the steel from coming into contact with the moisture in the soil, and so that way it's preventing corrosion. <clears throat> the third type of tank is the jacketed steel tank, and it's much like the, the, the clad steel tank, but in this case that you actually have a jacket that is on the outside of the steel. And 
basically, uh, that jacket is another, it's a non-corrodible, non-metallic material. And this basically turns this tank into a tank within a tank. So if you have a tank within a tank, then that means that it is secondarily contained, which means if you have a release from the inner tank, that there is another barrier that the regulated substance has to get through before it gets to the environment. So that's where it says secondarily contained. And the space between that inner tank and that outer tank wall can be monitored for release either from the regulated substance coming from the inner tank or it can also monitor for groundwater coming in from the outside of the jacket getting into that space. So then that way you can tell whether you have a release either from the inner wall that's holding the regulated substance or from the outer wall where groundwater could get into that interstitial space. And the third, uh, here's a picture of uh, four of these jacketed steel tanks in a series uh, getting ready to be backfilled. And basically what we're talking about here on these jacketed steel tanks that you can see that this is the inner wall, so this would be the inner tank that you're seeing here. And the space that we're monitoring is between this pink little layer that you're seeing here and this gold layer on the outside. It's not a very big space, very minute space, but you can, it's, it's a way to monitor whether you have a leak from that inner tank into that, into that space, or if you have groundwater coming from the outside of this, on this gold on the jacket out here, getting into that space. So it's a way that you can monitor for a leak from either wall. And the fourth type of tank that's out there is fiberglass reinforced plastic tanks. And these fiberglass reinforced plastic tanks, of course, non-metallic substance, you don't have to worry about corrosion here at all. So don't let them ask you later on today about is cathodic protection required on an FRP tank. It's not required because you don't have a metallic substance coming in contact with moisture in the soil. So those, those are the four types of tanks. Now here's some special case uh, where you can have compartmentalized tanks. And generally in each one of these compartments, they would hold different product grades of gasoline in these three compartments that you see here. You can also have manifolded tanks where we sh showed in that little drawing a minute ago where you have two or more tanks that are connected by the piping. And generally that piping, the, the manifolded tanks generally hold the same product and they pump from both tanks at the same time. <clears throat> and here is kind of a drawing that you can see here on, ma on, the, on these manifolded tanks and here's how they're manifolded by this, this particular pieces of pipe here going in between both of these two tanks. Now what you don't see that is on this particular drawing that's important is this fill pipe where people come and actually drop fuel into your, into your system or into your tanks. This fill pipe has to be at least four inches from the bottom of that tank to be effective. And you know basically they want to make sure that when the fuel is dropped that it goes to the bottom of the tank and it uniformly spills out instead of showering on top of the tank and you people that actually have to stick your tanks it would take a long time for the tank to actually quiet down enough to where you could get an accurate volume of what you had in the tank. So this is just a way for, it's a more uniform flow when they're dropping fuel at your facility. So just remember, four inches from the bottom of the tank for the fill pipe <clears throat> or the drop tube. Four inches from the bottom of the tank. So then you can also have double wall tanks, and these double wall tanks are, are, are much like the, much like the uh, jacketed tank where it's a tank within a tank. And of course, if you have a tank within a tank, then secondary containment is standard for these particular tanks. So common piping options. Now after we've been through the four different types of, of, of tanks that are basically out there, there's three piping options that are used for underground storage tank system, and one is cathodically protected steel, where you have bare steel 
that's actually coming in contact with the moisture that's in the soil. Uh, the second type of <clears throat> piping is fiberglass piping. It's a rigid fiberglass piping. And of course, non-metallic, so corrosion protection is not needed for the fiberglass piping. And the same <clears throat> along with the flexible plastic piping. It's out there. It looks just like common, ordinary garden hose type material. And again, non-metallic, so you don't have to worry about protecting that particular pipe from corrosion. So here's a picture of the fiberglass reinforced uh, plastic pipe that's out there. Of course, uh, it's rigid, non-flexible, non-metallic. Corrosion protection is not needed on this fiberglass reinforced plastic pipe. The flexible plastic pipe, like I said, looks just like your co common uh, garden hose variety type of of hose and again non-metallic corrosion protection is not needed but what's important here that you need to see inside these sumps where you can see if this sump here should happen to be liquid tight you don't want to have you don't want to have a free product laying up against this flexible plastic pipe so this is another thing when you're out walking around your facilities and you pull up one of these sump heads you want to make sure that if there is gasoline, you have flexible plastic pipe, you want to get that gasoline away from that flexible plastic pipe because it'll turn that flexible plastic pipe, the outside of it will turn it gummy and it'll allow it to expand. And you know, this whole thing that we're talking about here today is, is preventing releases. And if you have a release, we're going to try and catch them fast. Well, we're looking for a release if you're going to lay, let product lay next to that flexible plastic pipe for any period of time. Chances are you, you have a lot better chance of that flexible plastic pipe rupturing and having a release. So anytime that you're going out there, you actually see product and you're using flexible plastic pipe, you need to get, you need to get that gasoline away from that flexible plastic pipe. So, how do you know what you have at your facility? The easiest way is, is to find one of our uh, ADEQ's previous inspection reports at your facility. If you haven't made any changes or any repairs since the last cycle, and each, you know, our inspection cycles are done like in three years. So if you haven't had an inspection in three years, then you're probably getting ready to have one. But in each one of those inspection reports, it'll tell you exactly what type of tank that you have. It'll tell you what kind of pipe that you have. It'll tell you all the release detection things that you have or that are in place at your facility. So that's the easiest way to go back and find out what you've got. And if you don't have what is on that previous inspection report, then there's been repairs or, or things that have been done, that's a part of the notification requirements to the department. So if you're doing, making any repairs or any changes at your facility, ADEQ has to be notified of those repairs or changes. So just keep that in mind. We'll talk about the notification process a little bit later uh, this morning. But you, you also got to know what you have at your facility by what you have to test for. You know, you know, if you're doing corrosion protection for piping, then you probably know that you got bare steel pipe. So, and then you can get it from simple observation. You know, you can go and, and pull up the lids on those sumps, and you can look down there, and you can actually see what kind of piping that you have. Or else you can use uh, insulation records when guys actually dropped your your tank into, in, into that excavation site, they're going to tell you what you have at your facility. So you need to know what you have at your facility. It's important. So can you identify these type of tanks? This one up here to the, to the left, remember, is a cathodically protected steel tank. It has a zinc and magnesium or sacrificial anode welded to the outside of the tank, protecting the tank and the tank only. It has that protective dielectric coating on the outside that doesn't conduct electricity. So it isolates this tank from what was going to take place in the electrochemical corrosion cell. And then you have those Viton rings that are on the manway 
manways at the top of those tanks <clears throat> that are further isolating this tank from the electrochemical corrosion process. Over there on the right, you have the fiberglass reinforced plastic tank here that's showing the ridges. Non-metallic material, corrosion protection is not needed on that particular tank. <clears throat> and then you can see the clad steel tank that you have here at the bottom, this red tank. And like I said, that material that's on the outside of that steel is much more harder, much more tenacious than what this dielectric coating is on this particular tank. So when we get down to it, if you're <clears throat> this particular tank and the jacketed steel tank does not need corrosion protection either because it's hard, tenacious, tough material that's on the outside of protecting that steel. What kind of piping do we have here in these sumps? <clears throat> you can see on this particular sump here, this sump, you can see that there's actually bare metal and this is right on top of the backfill that's on top of your tank. And so by law, by 40 CFR 280, the federal regulations, any bare metal that comes in, into contact with the moisture that's in the soil has to be protected from corrosion. So anything touching the ground has to be, and it's bare metal, it has to be protected from corrosion by law. Now, you can see in this particular sump here, you can see there's some bare metal here. This bare metal is not required to be protected from corrosion by law <clears throat> because it's not in contact with the soil. And the same that you can see here with the stainless steel flex connector that you can see here, not required to be protected by law because it's not in contact with the soil. So in contact with the soil, it has to be protected from corrosion. And there's the three types of, of, of pipe that you can see. You can see the flexible plastic pipe here in the bottom of this sump. You can see some rigid fiberglass piping there. So another important date that was out here is July 1, 2007. Any new and replacement tanks or pressurized piping anything that's put into the ground after July 1, 2007, it has to be secondarily contained and it has to have a way for you to monitor that interstitial space. So in this case, we're talking like a pipe within a pipe or a tank within a tank and that with the interstitial space is that space between the inner tank and the wall of the outer tank that we can monitor for release from that inner tank wall interstitial space. Secondarily containment, it's another barrier that the regulated substance has to get to before it gets to the environment. <clears throat> so after that date, July 1, 2007, any new or replacement motor fuel dispensers had to have an under dispenser spill containment sump up underneath those dispensers. So this is another form here of secondarily contained, secondary containment. If you have a leak, you could go and actually take the, 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 the cover off your dispenser. You could actually look down in there to see if you actually had free product in this dispenser. Another form of, in these particular sumps, another form of secondary containment. It's got to get through another barrier before it gets to the environment. So you need to know what you have at your facility and you have to know what an upgraded tank or upgraded piping is. We'll go through that one more time. Upgraded tanks and piping. If you have bare steel, bare steel in contact with moisture in the soil, it has to be protected from corrosion. Or or either that bare steel can be replaced with a non-corrodible material so then you don't have to protect it from corrosion. And spill and overfill protection had to be added to those tanks. Remember we talked about December of 88, the feds gave you for 10 years 
to upgrade existing tanks to new tank standards. And that was overfill pre prevention, release prevention, and corrosion protection to those tanks. <clears throat> all the ones that were in after <clears throat> 1988, all this stuff had to be standard when the tanks were actually dropped into the ground. So, important dates. Now, the rest of this stuff, we go, <clears throat> this starts following along right with spill protection that you're going to see in that study guide. So, the rest of this stuff just kind of follows along uh, with what you have there in the study guide. But for spill protection, spill protection, any underground storage tank system that's filled with 25 gallons or more at one time has to have some form of spill protection. <clears throat> These particular devices, they prevent spills that may occur when the delivery hose is disconnected from that fill pipe. And remember that fill pipe has to go into the tank within four inches of the bottom of that tank. These devices are called spill buckets or catchment basins. These spill buckets and catchment basins are not designed to hold product for long periods of time. So, you know, most of the time at most facilities, people are going to get a drop of fuel in the evening when they're not busy. And so anytime that you should happen to get a drop of fuel at your facility, once that drop is done, you need to go out and look at your spill bucket to see if you've got anything in it. And if you've got something in it, if there's spilled product in there, that spilled product, you need to get it out of that spill bucket or catchment basin. And I don't mean, you know, even if you're using like a turkey baster to get it out, but you're not taking that material and shooting it out on, the, on your cement and then taking the pressure hose and running it to your storm drain. You put it in another bucket, you send it back to a fuel blender or a recycler or something. But you need, <clears throat> you need to keep your spill buckets clean. Some of these spill buckets will have drain valves that are actually in the bottom. And if you've got a spill, you can actually go in there, pick up, pull up on that drain valve. <clears throat> Everything caught in the spill bucket then will make its way back into your tank. Now, <clears throat> if you don't keep the spill bucket clean, somebody drops fuel and let's say you've got some water that's in that spill bucket or you've got some dirt or debris that's in that spill bucket and you've got one of these drains whenever you drain whatever has been spilled that's dropped in there then all that other stuff that's in that spill bucket it makes it into your tank you might not deal with it this month next month sooner or later you're going to deal with a dirty spill bucket and having that stuff go into your tank so catchment basins have to be clean. And you know, basically the hose, the delivery hose that comes from that truck, generally it's like 12 or 13 feet long. It's four inches in diameter. So just the hose itself coming from the, the, the delivery truck will hold like 13 gallons of gasoline. These particular spill buckets, most of them are designed to hold five or six gallons of product. So number one, the hose has, a, has enough stuff in it coming from the tanker to overfill your spill bucket. So if you've got water in it or you've got product in from the last drop of fuel, then you know, you're cutting down the volume that that particular catchment basin can hold. So you know, if they're set up to hold six gallons, then let's make sure that they're clean and they can hold at least that six gallons of gasoline. So basically what we talked about, if you get a spill inside the catchment basin, you pull up the, the drain valve, any stuff that you have that's been collected in that catchment basin, whether it's old product or it's water or it's dirt and debris, it's going to make its way into your tank. You want to stay away from that. And here's, here's a picture of four different catchment basins that you can see here. The two on the left are in pretty good shape. And in this particular catchment basin, you can see the drain valve that's in the bottom of this particular uh, spill bucket. So when the, when the hose is disconnected from the fill pipe, if you have some drops or if you have a little bit of a spillage, it's gonna be caught inside this bucket. 
Then you can go in there, reach down there, pull up that drain valve, all that stuff then will drain back into your tank. So those two are in good shape. They're clean. They look pretty good. The two on the, on the far right over here, they need to be cleaned out. And you know, and I will say this, whenever you go and you inspect your spill buckets, and you should go out and every time that you see your spill bucket and that spill bucket is dry and there's nothing in that spill bucket, I bet you that you've got a leak in that spill bucket. Because that spill bucket's going to catch water, rainfall or whatever is going to find its way into these particular spill buckets. So if you go out there and you see that it is dry, every time that you look in there, I bet you got a crack in that spill bucket or this particular fitting on the fill pipe is not liquid tight. And you'll have product that's just running down that fill pipe right on top of the backfill on top of your tanks. So just keep that in mind. But these two, like I said, these two definitely need to be cleaned out. So <clears throat> why is the concern about these spill buckets? The big thing here is we got, we're, we're talking about a five gallon bucket that's liquid tight to the fill pipe. 47% of all releases that happen at underground storage tank facilities take place at this little five gallon bucket. And so that's why they need to be maintained. You can see if you took the, 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 what happens coming from the pipe at an underground storage tank system, you take, take from the tanks underground storage tank system or from the dispensers, you combine all those together, the, the spill bucket or catchment basin the releases from them are greater than any of those three combined. And you know, it's something that you can see. All you have to do is take the manhole cover off and look where somebody's dropping your fuel and you have to make sure those things are, that they're clean, they don't have any cracks in them, and then you're taking care of 40, 47% of releases at your facility. So, you know, I mean, it's just a minor little thing here that a five gallon bucket can produce this amount of releases at underground storage tank facilities. So just keep that in mind, keep them clean, inspect them, make sure you don't have any cracks in them, make sure that, that, that uh, the union around that fill pipe is liquid tight. Hard to see, but you can see here if you've, got spill, if you've spilled any gasoline into this particular spill bucket here, it's not going to hold it for long. The gasoline's going to drop right out onto the backfill that's on top of your tank. It's going to make its way down to the groundwater. That groundwater moves just like the Arkansas River, and it's going to make its way to somebody's drinking water well, and it's going to contaminate it and the soil and the groundwater remediation is very costly, very costly. So you, you want to make sure that these babies are liquid tight. So which of the tanks out there do not need to have catchment basins or spill buckets? Those that are not are filled with 25 gallons or less at one time are not required to have spill buckets. 25 gallons or more, you better have a spill bucket at, at your facility or you're out of compliance. <coughs> Hopefully you all have spill buckets, catchment basins at your facility. And next question is, they need to be in good working order. Hopefully you can answer yes to both of those questions. So spill buckets, catchment basins, very important piece of equipment, even though it's just a little five gallon thing hooked to your fill pipe. Now, we're gonna go to overfill, pro overfill protection for your tanks. Overfill protection. Just like what we were talking about, spill prevention, any underground storage tanks that's filled with 25 gallons or more at one time has to have some form of spill prevention. And let me just say this before we even talk about the three different types of spill prevention or, or overfill protection that's out there, is that you guys as tank owners and operators, you got to know how much empty space that you have in your tanks. 
you have to order only the amount of fuel that would fit into that empty space. And if you do that, then you don't have to worry about these three overfill protection devices that we're going to talk about. So it's a matter of, you know, using your automatic tank gauge or going out and sticking your tank, know how much available empty space you have in your tank and only order that amount of fuel that will go into that empty space. If you do that, then you don't have to worry about these three uh, overfill protection devices that we're going to talk about. That's basically what I just talked about. You have to know how much empty space or ullage is, in, is available in the tank before you order product. So the overfill protection devices that they're out there, there's three types. The first one stops the product flow going into the tank. The second one, it actually reduces the product flow going into the tank. And the third one is an audio or a visual alarm or an, uh, and an alert that notifies the driver that your tank is almost full. So three types, stops, reduces the flow, and then uh, alarms to alert the driver of potential overfill. So the first one, and, and this is important, the only one that goes to work when the tank is 95% full is this automatic shutoff valve. Automatic shutoff is 95% tank full. Automatic shutoff or device is generally called a flapper valve. 95% full. The other two remaining, the reducing the flow and the alarms to alert the driver that the tank is almost full they go to work when the tank is 90% full. So 95% for the automatic and the other two overfill protection devices go to work when the tank is 90% full. So the automatic shutoff valve or flapper valve, it actually slows and stops the product flow from the tanker going into your tank when the tank is 95% full. This particular device is located in the fill pipe. You can see this particular device by looking down your fill pipe and you can see the automatic shutoff valve. And remember, 95% full for the automatic. So this is when you look down your fill pipe and you can see this half moon type structure that you can see in both of these things that you're looking at here, it's going to show you that you have an automatic shutoff or a flapper valve at your facility. That's just looking right down to where they drop the fuel into your tanks. If you see that, you've got the automatic shutoff or flapper valve at your facility. This is basically how they work, kind of like uh, your, your commode at home. When the, the, the water level in the back of your commode gets to a certain level, it automatically shuts off the water. That's exactly what happens here on this particular device. It'll shut off the flow of gasoline going into your tank when your tank reaches that 95% level. So this is what they look like on the ground. You can see th there's, a partic there's that flapper valve that you can see right here, and here is a close-up of it in this other diagram. Now, what our inspectors don't want to see is for all you people that actually stick your tanks. And in this particular case, here's a guy that's got a, he's got a uh, overfill protection on his tank, and then he's rammed his tank gauge stick down in there. Well, how's that flapper valve going to work? It's not going to. So don't let one of our inspectors come out to your facility if you've got this automatic shutoff valve and see your tank gauge stuck in there, preventing that flapper valve from doing its job. The second type of overfill protection that's out there is the ball float valve. And the ball float valve is located inside the tank in the vent piping of the tank. Now remember that vent piping has to be 12 feet, at least 12 feet above ground. 
That vent piping, it restricts the flow of vapors that's coming outside of the tank, coming from the tank itself. And what actually happens here is when this ball float valve, it has a, there's a, a, a stainless steel ball in a cage. The stainless steel ball, as the tank fills up, the, the amount of product actually takes that ball and seats it into that vent piping. And when it seats it into that vent piping, the hose coming from the delivery truck will jump. And the driver will know that the tank is 90% full. Now that only works if the driver's out there doing what he's supposed to do. He's not in talking to the girl that's working a point of sale system. And he'll never see the hose jump and never know that the tank is 90% full. So that's a part of his job. So normally restricts the flow going into the tank when the tank is 90% full because the last thing you want to do is to seat that ball in that vent pipe and if you had a pressurized delivery instead of just a gravity drop of fuel well then you know you're going to put undue stress and strain on any seams that are on that underground tank and you could have a rupture and lose everything so this is basically for gravity drops not pressurized fuel uh, deliveries into your tank. So your facility records may indicate whether you have this at your uh, have this device at your facility, and or the contractor who actually installed it may know or be able to tell you that you have this ball float valve at your facility. So this is basically what they look like. You can see the ball inside this little cage right here as the product level increases in the tank. It takes that ball, takes it, seats it right up against that vent pipe. When it seats up against that vent pipe, the hose coming from the, the, uh, the transport jumps and lets the driver know that that ball is seated in that vent pipe and that the tank is almost full. So this is what they look like inside the tank. And this is what they look like when they're not working well. No ball in there, no seat. So in this case right here, the, the driver overfills the tank and it's, it's a gravity drop of fuel. What happens here? The fuel's going up the vent pipe as high as it is in the tanker that's actually dropping the load. So, you know, what do you do then? You sit there until enough people pump enough gasoline to get it out of the vent pipe. Same thing here, about ready to lose the ball in this particular one. These things don't work well unless you have a ball that's going to seat up against that vent pipe. Now, the third uh, mode of overfill protection is the overfill alarms. Now, all you guys that have automatic tank gauges in this case, an automatic tank gauge is generally inside a facility. And the automatic tank gauge alarm will go off to let you know that your tank is 90% full. But these particular alarms only work good when the driver can see or hear an alarm to let him know that he needs to shut off flow going into the tank. So, you know, these things, these, this, the overfill alarms are only good when the driver can see and or hear the alarm going off. So there, if you have an automatic tank gauge, it'll go off inside your facility. But for them to be effective, they need to be out where the driver can see them. And I think later on, when you're going to see these overfill alarms, not only do they go off and to let you know that the tank is 90% full, but you have one minute to shut off that flow before you overfill this tank using this, this method, the overfill alarm. So, and this is what the signaling devices should look like. And like I said, these, what you see right here and here, it should be in a position where the driver can actually see it and hear it. I mean, your automatic tank gauge, if you had one, will go off where somebody inside the building 
will be able to hear the alarm go off in there, but they're only effective if the driver knows that he's about ready to overfill the tank. So three types of overfill protection devices that are out there, three types. One is to stop the flow. That is automatic shutoff valve or flapper valve and it works when the tank is 95% full. The other two modes, the ball float valve and the alarm, both work when the tank is 90% full. And for the overfill alarm, 90% full and within one minute of the tank overfilling. So, which one of these tanks are not required to have overfill protection? One more time, 25 gallons or less being dropped at one time, you don't have to have overfill protection. Any 25 gallons or more, got to have overfill protection at your facility. Which of these overfill devices can you see by looking down the fill pipe? Automatic shutoff or flapper valve, that's correct. So, do you have overfill protection at your facility? Hopefully you do. If you don't, you're out of compliance. Right now we're going to talk a little bit here about corrosion protection. All uh, regulated underground tanks and piping must be protected from corrosion. If it's a, a bare metal and it's in contact with moisture in the soil, it has to be protected from corrosion. So corrosion can be defined as the deterioration of metal due to a reaction with its environment. That environment is the moisture that's in the soil. External corrosion of buried steel structures is an electrochemical process. For that process to occur, you have to have areas with different electrical potential have to exist on the metal that's in the ground. These areas have to be electrically connected and they have to be in contact with an electrolyte. In this case, this electrolyte is the moisture that's in the soil. It's what drives that electrochemical corrosion cell. And then when we're talking about they have to be electrically connected, and when we were talking about that STIP3 tank, how we were keeping that tank from being uh, electrically connected was with those Viton rings or bushings that were in those manways, that dielectric protected coating that was on the outside of the steel that's not conducting direct current and that's how we're protecting it for from the from the electro of, of charging that electrochemical corrosion cell so four components four components to that electrochemical corrosion cell you have to have an anode you have to have a cathode you have to have an electrolyte and you have to have an electrical path. So the anode, the anode has the more positive potential of the metals that are connected. And the anode is where the corrosion takes place. Remember on the STIP3 tank, we have that bar welded to the outside of the tank. Corrosion's taking place on that bar not on that tank that's holding the regulated substance. We don't want holes in the tank. The second, the cathode has the more negative potential of the metals that are connected. And what we're doing here in protection is in corrosion, we're turning the tank into the cathode. We want the corrosion to take place at the anode and not on the, on the, uh, what's holding the regulated substance. Then you have to have the electrolyte and the electrolyte it says soil or water but it is the moisture that's in the soil. Moisture in the soil is the electrolyte and the electrical path is just the, the path that this can run through on the tank itself or on the actual piping. 
So four components in the electrochemical corrosion cell. You have to have an anode, a cathode, you have to have an electrolyte, the moisture in the soil, or you have to have a path for this electrochemical corrosion cell to take place. And you know, basically what we're talking about here, we take a piece of metal. We run this piece of metal, this bar, we run it into some wet soil. You have the corrosion taking place here at the an anode. You have the electron flow go going from the anode to the cathode, and the same with the current flow. So remember, anode, cathode, electrolyte, and path is what you got to have for corrosion, uh, electrochemical corrosion cell. Now, there's some kind of tanks in piping that do not need additional corrosion protection, and we already went through that on the tanks. The clad steel tank, corrosion protection is not needed. The jacketed steel tank, corrosion protection is not needed. Fiberglass reinforced plastic tank, corrosion protection is not needed. Non-metallic materials in contact with the moisture that's in the soil. Corrosion protection is not needed. So here we go, fiberglass reinforced plastic tank up here on the right, top right. Corrosion protection is not needed. You got the, the uh, jacketed steel tank here. Corrosion protection is not needed. Jacketed steel tank has basically a, a non-corrodible material that's, that's on the outside of the steel tank. Corrosion protection is not needed. No additional protection is required for this bare metal that you see here. You can see a stainless steel flex connector here inside the sump. Why is corrosion protection not needed there? It's not coming in contact with the soil. The same for this bare metal pipe that you're going to see here. If it's in contact with the soil, different story. It has to be protected from corrosion. Bare steel tanks or piping do need more protection. Now you can see that the bare steel tanks, they can no longer be upgraded. They have to be replaced or closed, one of the two. And the stainless steel flex connectors associated with the piping that we saw there, if it does come in contact with the soil, then it has to be protected. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute too. So this is what we don't want to see. None of these vessels here is going to hold a lot of gasoline for a long period of time. And that's what we're protecting from corrosion. We don't want to see that on anything holding gas. Now, here's some bare metal that does need corrosion protection. You're going to see bare metal in contact with the soil. Bare metal again in contact with the backfill on top of the tank. Got to protect it from corrosion. Same here. You can see a stainless steel flex connector going right into the backfill on top of the tank. Got to be protected from corrosion. Bare steel here. Backfill on top of the tank in contact with moisture in the soil, corrosion protection is needed. So how are we going to protect things from corrosion? We can do it cathodically, protect it, by using sacrificial anodes like what we saw on the STIP3 tank. We can also use an impressed current system to protect bare metal from corrosion. We can internally line a tank or you can use a combination of both cathodic protection and that internal tank lining. And like I said, the internal tank lining or a combo of this stuff doesn't happen much anymore. You're going to just go ahead and fix the tank. So <clears throat> The sacrificial anode system, on the sacrificial anode system, just like what we saw earlier on the STIP3 tank. These guys come out there and <clears throat> they're going to determine the
the potential between the tank and the moisture that's in the soil where the tank is going to be dropped in the excavation zone. And then these guys are going to determine how many of these sacrificial anodes that they need to weld to the outside of the tank. And remember, in this case here, these sacrificial anodes are protecting the tank and the tank only. So you have more moisture in the soil, you're going to have more of these sacrificial anodes welded to the side of the tank. If you're in Nevada or you're out in Phoenix or someplace like that, you know, you could probably get by with half of one of these bars welded to this particular tank. You get down to Florida where the groundwater is right up next to the, the, the ground level and you've got a lot of moisture in the soil, well then you're going to need more of these sacrificial anodes because the, the driving process of that electrochemical corrosion cell is going to eat up those sacrificial anodes. Okay, so here in this case you're going to see you're going to see a place where they're going to weld two of these zinc and magnesium bars to this tank. And not only do they weld them to this side of the tank, they weld them to the other side of the tank too. So when these things are actually put onto the tank, the manufacturer is going to make sure that those sacrificial anodes should be good for the lifetime of that underground storage tank system. Because that's the last thing you want to do is have to do what they're doing here, pull this tank out of, out of the ground and slap on some more sacrificial anodes. So here again, we're going to show it on this STIP3 tank. And you know, you're, you're going to ask why, you know, it has, the, it has those electrical isolation bushings here. It has that dielectric protective coating on the outside of these tanks. Why are we protecting this, this tank from corrosion with these sacrificial anodes? Well, the difference here is, is that the, the outer surface, this dielectric material that's on the outside of this STIP3 tank, when, the, when these tanks are backfilled and you put material on top of these tanks to hold them into the ground, then when that material gets put on the top of these tanks, there's going to be some scratches, there's going to be some nicks, there's going to be some dings to this dielectric protective coating. And so basically what these sacrificial anodes are protecting are those areas where you have nicks, dings, scratches, cuts on that dielectric, dielectric uh, material that's on the outside where you're actually getting to the point where you're exposing the bare metal of the tank to the moisture that's in the soil in those spots where it's scratched, dinged, cut, whatever. And that's what you're protecting here. So, you know, basically, in a, in a perfect world, if you went in there and you backfilled these things, you wouldn't even need the sacrificial anodes out there if you didn't get any scratches, dings, nicks, or cuts on this dielectric material. So, cathodic protection is a technique for preventing corrosion by making the entire surface of the metal that you want to protect act as the cathode of that electrochemical cell. Corrosion is not actually eliminated, but it's transferred from the metal surface to the external anode. So, you know, you turn the tank into the cathode. The cathode's what's holding the regulated substance, what you don't want to get released to the environment, and you're whittling away at the sacrificial anode that's attached to that tank. That's where the corrosion's taking place. Hence the name sacrificial anode. It's sacrificing itself to protect the tank or the cathode. So the advantages, the advantages to the sacrificial anode protection system is, number one, there's no external power supply. Installation is easier because it's done at the factory. They're going to weld on those bars and bring them out there and drop them into place at your facility. <clears throat> Hence the maintenance, maintenance costs are lower. But the most important thing that you have to remember about the sacrificial anode protection corrosion system is, is that it is only effective, only effective for protection of small electrically isolated structures. So electrically isolated is what we're doing on that STIP3 tank where we have that protective dielectric coating on the outside of it and then we have those uh, electrical isolation bushings that are in 
those man waves at the top of the tank. So electrically isolated. So that's why these work perfect here on these particular tanks. And like I said, we're only protecting the, the small amounts of bare metal that are actually going to come in contact with the moisture in the soil from when the backfill actually scratches, cuts, nicks, or dings that dielectric protective coating on the outside of the tank. Now, that doesn't happen if, you, if that's happening, if, you, if you're doing that on a clad steel tank or a jacketed steel tank, then I'm telling you, you're using the wrong backfill because that should never happen. And that's why on those particular tanks, they don't need to be protected from corrosion. But these, this does. So, conversely, the disadvantage of the sacrificial anode system, it is not effective on large uncoated steel structures. And why is that? We just talked about that. It eats those sacrificial anodes up just like that. You got to go out there, jackhammer the concrete, pull the tank up out of the ground, slap some more sacrificial anodes on there. So you don't want to do that. Anode life may be short when you're protecting large bare uh, steel areas of buried steel. So disadvantages of the sacrificial anode system. So, and then this, basically this is what's happened. A simple method for monitoring the effectiveness of a cathodic protection system is to you measure the electrical potential between the structure you're trying to protect and the soil that it's coming in contact with. So that takes care of the sacrificial anode system. Now we're going to talk about the impressed current system. In the impressed current system, it uses a rectifier that actually provides, it takes alternating current, switches it to direct current, and it takes this direct current and sends it to the anodes. In this case, with the, the impressed current system, the anodes are not attached to the tank. They're in proximity to the tank in the backfill. Okay? So, <clears throat> the impressed current, it has to have continuous power for it to work. Continue, it has to be continuously powered. And these impressed current systems are always installed in the field, and they're always installed in the field by people by a qualified corrosion expert that's licensed through ADEQ to do that work. You're not just going to find anybody and tell them off the street and just have them come in here and uh, build me an impressed current system for my underground storage tanks. These guys are qualified uh, through us to do the work. This is what the rectifier boxes actually look like. And on these particular rectifier boxes, there's three gauge, gauges. They'll show volts and amps that you're going to see in here. And when this guy des designs this system, he's going to give you some ranges where the volts and amps need to be on this rectifier. And then this top thing, that you, the, the top gauge that you see up here, it's measuring constantly how long that this rectifier has been on. That way you have a, a check and balance to know that the daggum thing has been, been on X amount of hours and that you're not shutting it off. So if you have an impressed current system, that rectifier should be on a separate circuit at your facility so that it is all, so that the rectifier <coughs> is always on. The last thing you want to do is to go and shut off your light switch when you leave at night and shut off your impressed, uh, the, the rectifier for your impressed current system. So that system has to be continuously powered. And, you know, basically this is what happens, what we're talking about here. The rectifier takes alternated, alternating current. Now, you can see here in this particular setup, we've got the anodes. And instead of them being attached to the tank, they're in the backfill in proximity to the tank. So this alternating current being switched to direct current, that direct current then is sent to those anodes to each one of those anodes. And so there's a flexible output current that's coming from that rectifier. So you can lower it or you can increase it. And what actually happens is you're actually 
you're putting enough electrical current, direct current to these anodes so that it overcomes what's actually coming from the tank that would be going to the anode. So that's how this works. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's almost like voodoo and we could talk about corrosion protection, you know, for a full day and how this stuff works. But basically that power is turned up to where whatever's coming from the tank to the anode is overcome from by the direct current that's being sent to those anodes. And that's how you're protecting this tank from corrosion. So the advantages of an impressed current system is the big one down here, it's capable of protecting large bare steel structures. And that's because you got the flexible output coming from that rectifier. Flexible out, out, output current coming from it, also, the impressed current systems, they're also uh, capable of protecting other underground structures that are in there, like if you would happen to have some, you know, some wastewater piping down there, you could protect it from corrosion using this system by turning up the amount of electricity coming to those anodes. Now, the disadvantages, of course, to the impressed current system is higher maintenance costs for this particular method because you're using electricity. So that's one of the big advantages, uh, our, our disadvantages. And another disadvantage is, like I said, that the current may be switched off. If the current is switched off to the rectifier, then you're not getting corrosion protection for your tank. So that's what you need to keep in mind. All readings taken from this rectifier have to meet this minus 850 millivolt criteria to pass your corrosion protection test. Minus 850 millivolts. Minus 852 pass, minus 857 pass, minus 861 pass, minus 848, you're not passing your corrosion protection using this system. So here we go about the other way that we can actually do this, a combination of cathodic protection and actually internally lining the tank. And you can see why that there's a lot of, that this is not done much anymore. You know, you put on your Martian suit, jump inside the tank at 150 degrees outside. It's 250 inside the tank. Cat's huffing the vapors from whatever he's using to line the inside of that tank. And then the worst part is, is that after this is done, then you have to get back in. There's a possibility that you have to get back in there to actually inspect this internal lining, and that's why they don't do it much anymore. So internal inspections, if you're going to line them, you have to do it within 10 years of, of, of lining the tank, and then you have to do it at least every five years after that, with the exception being, if you do this, if the cathodic protection is added before that lining is 10 years old and the integrity of the tank was insured, when the cathodic protection was installed, then you don't have to do internal inspections. So like I said, it's not done much anymore. Those boys are about out of business. And you know, call the regulated storage tank division of ADEQ for guidance before you add cathodic protection to a line tank. So we, sh we showed some pictures a little bit earlier of these stainless steel flex connectors. Now there's two ways that these stainless steel flex connectors can be protected from corrosion. One is you can isolate that flex connector from direct contact with the moisture that's in the soil, or you can add cathodic protection to that stainless steel flex connector. And basically this is how that's done. Number one, here's how you isolate it. You could actually run that stainless steel flex connector in, inside this boot you let the boot come in contact with the moisture that's in the soil and the stainless steel flex connector is touching nothing, just like it being in the sump. Or, in this case, much like the STIP3 tank, what you can do here, you can use this connector, you can actually, this rod right here is just like the sacrificial anode on the STIP3 tank, zinc and magnesium bar. You take that bar 
you drive it down into the moisture that's in the soil in proximity to the stainless steel flex connector. You attach the stainless steel fl flex connector with this fitting to this bar and we're going to corrode now from the bar and not on the stainless steel flex connector. So just like what happens on the STIP3 tank, same thing. Zinc and magnesium bar corrodes, stainless steel flex connector doesn't. Now in this case here, what is this particular cathodic protection, what is it protecting? It's protecting again what it's attached to. So in this case, it's attached to the piping. So cathodic protection protecting the piping here and not the tank. Only protecting what it is attached to. So unprotected steel flex, uh, stainless steel flex connectors. You can see that it's not inside one of those jackets or a boot right here. So, you know, it better be connected and there better, better, better be uh, one of those driving rod anodes better be in the ground next to that particular thing, otherwise it's going to corrode. One that you see down here inside the sump, not in contact with moisture in the soil, not required to have corrosion protection. So, now, there's about, I can't tell you how many test questions are coming up right here in, this, in these next couple of slides. But there, there's enough that you don't want to miss them. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Any of the corrosion protection methods that are out there, it doesn't make any difference which one that we're talking about. They have to be tested within six months of them being installed or repaired. Within six months of installation or them being repaired. They have to be tested and then you have to test them at least once every three years after that. You have to maintain the record of your last corrosion tests. Six months insulation or repair. And I'm going to tell you that's just for the test question because you're not going to have somebody, a corrosion protection engineer is not going to come down, set up a system at your facility and then say, I'll be back in six months to test it. He's going to test it before he leaves. He's going to install it. He's going to test it and make sure that it works before he goes anywhere. But for a part of the test, six months, insulation or repair, and then every three years. Same thing for the impressed current system. Same exact thing. Six months of it being installed or repaired, and then at least every three years. Now, the big difference here is in the impressed current system, that the rectifier, that rectifier has to be inspected every 60 days. Six months, insulation and repair, every three years, rectifier once every 60 days for the impressed current system. And in this case, for the impressed current system, instead of keeping until your next test, you got to maintain the record of your last two corrosion protection tests for impressed current and your last three rectifier readings. So you know there's six or eight test questions right there on those two slides. So what is the difference between the sacrificial anode and the impressed current cathodic protection system? The sacrificial system consists of anodes, sacrificial anodes, that sacrifice themselves to protect the tank or piping which is going to be the cathode in that electrochemical corrosion cell. <clears throat> the sacrificial system, no external power is needed. On the impressed current system, it has a rectifier that's supplying the power that's actually going to the anodes, that's overcoming what's coming from the tank to the anodes to protect both the tank and or piping. So the impressed current system is probably going to take care of both your tank and your piping if it's bare metal. So which of the tanks and piping are not required to have corrosion protection? And that is 
non-corrodible materials such as fiberglass, fiberglass clad, jacketed tanks, or fiberglass and flexible plastic pipe. Non-corrodible materials, corrosion protection is not needed. So, big thing here is, do you know if your tanks and piping have corrosion protection if it's needed? But the big thing is here is if you, if you have something that needs to be protected from corrosion, the big thing is, has it been tested? That's the big thing. Remember, six months insulation or repair, and then once every three years. Easy to forget to do your corrosion protection test if you need to do it.